Hello again, everybody. We are going to turn our attention here to tuberculosis. Uh, I suspect that you probably already watched my video on pneumonia, uh, where I talk about the most common lung infection. Now we're going to talk about something that's a little bit more obscure, especially if you are an American trainee or doctor, um, or even European, certainly, uh, because this is just not something that we see too much in the developed world. However, it is still a big problem elsewhere. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And if you haven't, definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. I'm trying to do as many as I can. Usually it's about three or four a week, uh, but sometimes more. Okay, so at one time, TB was the leading cause of death in the United States before we started coming out with all these great antibiotics. TB is highly contagious, and it is very deadly if it's not treated. Fortunately, now we can treat it. Uh, but primarily, it is a problem in developing countries. Why is that? Well, because we're so fast to treat it in developed countries. In developing countries, however, they're not as fast to treat it, and so it just gets spread around more. Any time with an infectious disease that you're able to treat something very quickly, naturally the incidence is going to go down because it's just not circulating around as much. If you're treated with TB, you're not contagious. Okay, risk groups, um, you can see all of them here. The big ones in the United States are immigrants who come from endemic regions, travelers who went to endemic regions, immunosuppressed people, and those, this is a big one, on anti-TNF drugs. What kind of drugs are those? infliximab is the big one. Um, and so those are going to be patients who are being treated with immunomodulators for things like Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis. Routine screening is actually not recommended anymore for asymptomatic people, particularly we're talking about healthcare workers, um, not patients. Um, it's not recommended that we uh, screen anymore, but a lot of hospitals do it, and so it is going to be useful for you to know how to interpret a screen, and we'll go into that. And then, of course, always, always, always screen patients who are on an anti-TNF drug. We're going to go on it. And the reason is because TNF is responsible for maintaining a granuloma. A granuloma is a walled-off infection. So if you block your body's ability to maintain that granuloma, you're going to cause an infection. That infection is going to spread because the granuloma is the only thing keeping it in check. So history on the USMLE, it's going to be someone in a high-risk group, often an immigrant or somebody who traveled. Uh, the symptoms are going to be your typical pulmonary infection symptoms, fever, fever, sputum, and a cough. You see that in pneumonia. However, these patients will also have a more protracted course, and oftentimes they'll have things like weight loss and night sweats and stuff that we associate with things like the flu. Um, but it's not the flu. It's tuberculosis. So you got a patient with protracted pulmonary symptoms, weight loss and stuff. Sometimes you might think, oh, this might be lung cancer, and you might be right. Um, so the best initial test, therefore, is a chest x-ray. At the same time, you are going to be getting a sputum sample, and you're going to get an acid-fast smear uh, and culture with that. So you're going to get both of these at the same time. Uh, so that's very, very important, chest x-ray and sputum. Now, if they have a positive chest x-ray, which we'll go into what that's going to look like, then your best next step is to initiate ripe therapy. So if you've got a positive smear, you are going to initiate ripe therapy. That's rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Um, now, it used to be ripes or spire. Uh, we used to have another drug called streptomycin. We don't do that anymore. This is a positive chest x-ray for TB. So these two on the left here are a walled off uh, infection. And what you see here is a calcified granuloma. And then you also see some hilar lymphadenopathy. Both of these are very common in uh, TB. And this together is called a gone complex. The tuberculo or the, uh, sorry, the granuloma is actually called a gone 
uh, focus, and then together with the lymphadenopathy, it's called a gone complex, and this is classic TB. Now, what we see on the right here is a much more disseminated pulmonary infection. You can see with all the infiltrates, um, this is a miliary TB, miliary, not military, miliary. Okay, so these are the four drugs that we give, rifamp and isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and nethambutol. You got to know the, uh, the side effects of these medications because that's commonly tested on the exam. So rifampin is easy. It causes red secretions. R for rifampin, R for red. These secretions are harmless, but it's going to freak people out. They're going to go home. They're going to pee orangish red. They're going to think, oh my gosh, I'm peeing blood. Um, so this can be alarming, but it is harmless. Um, Rifampin is contraindicated in uh, pretty much all patients with HIV. Why? Because it's contraindicated for people getting protease inhibitors, and it's contraindicated in people getting NNRTIs. So what that pretty much en uh, encompasses is all people who are on antiretroviral therapy, because most of them are going to be on one of those two. Now remember, protease inhibitors for HIV, those all end in Navir, uh, and the ones that we use in hepatitis, they all end in Previr. So remember those suffixes and you'll know your protease inhibitors. Uh, tenofovir is another one, but that's specifically tenofovir alphenamide. You probably will not be asked that. So if you've got a patient who cannot be on rifampin, you're going to give them rifabutin instead. Isoniazid can cause peripheral neuropathy because it reduces your level of B6. So for that reason, we always accompany isoniazid with B6. And um, in these patients, uh, we also have to monitor their liver function tests because isoniazid is mildly hepatotoxic. Pyrazinamide can cause hyperuricemia. If, it, if they do develop a gout, do not discontinue it. Just treat the gout. Uh, however, if they have a significant past medical history of gout, you may replace this, but that's not going to be asked on your exam. It is also not recommended in pregnancy. Ethambutol, think I thambutol, causes optic neuritis. Now, the duration, this will also get asked. It's two months on all four, and then four months on two, and the two are rifampin and isoniazid. At the end of the treatment, you're going to repeat the chest x-ray and sputum to ensure you have eradication. Extrapulmonary findings. Uh, the most common extrapulmonary site is the lymph nodes. Now, you're going to see hyalur lymphadenopathy in a lot of them, but sometimes it can spread to the cervical lymph nodes. In that case, you're going to have a unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, you can see osteomyelitis, which is also called POTS syndrome. This is often going to go to the vertebrae. Primary manifestation is bone pain. TB meningitis meningitis symptoms, meningismus. TB pericarditis, pericarditis symptoms. You're not going to be able to distinguish this from other causes right off the bat. And then miliary TB, that's just widespread disseminated TB. The treatment for any of these, uh, if you've got an extra pulmonary TB manifestation, you're going to do a longer course of therapy. You don't, you don't need to know anything more than that. TB meningitis and pericarditis should also get steroids. Now, for screening, we have two ways of going about it, the Manto test and IGRA. The Manto test is the biggest pain in the butt because you have to memorize the induration uh, interpretations. So basically what we're doing here is we're injecting tuberculin proteins, expecting that if the patient has had a prior exposure, they're going to have uh, antibodies, and that's going to elicit a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Consequently, uh, we will have an induration. Now, how we interpret that induration is uh, somewhat difficult. So in anyone who has an induration of less than five millimeters, that is a negative test. And in anyone who has an induration of more than 15 millimeters, that is always a positive test. Now, whether we use 10 or five as a cutoff depends on the patient. So if you're dealing with a patient who's just at high risk so they work in a hospital, they work in a nursing home, they're from an endemic area, um, then we, can, we, we will cut, set the cutoff at 10 millimeters. If it's a patient who's sick or on drugs, we set it to five. So these are patients with HIV, people who are immunocompromised, so maybe they're on anti-organ rejection medications, or they are on anti-TNF drugs or high-dose corticosteroids, or if they are a close contact, then we set it at five. So you will need to know this for your exam. 
IGRA is a blood test. It's nice because you only need to get go in once to get this done. Um, and uh, with the Manto test, you need to go in once to get the injection and once to get it read. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, however, with the IGRA, you only need to get tested once. Negative screen means no TB. Uh, some patients you may repeat, particularly if they've never tested before, but in most patients, one is fine. Positive screen, then you're gonna go on and get a chest x-ray and sputum, just like you would with somebody coming in with symptoms. Uh, if they uh, do indeed have a negative test after the screen, you're gonna consider this latent TB. And in that case, you do isoniazid and rifapentin. Now, in the past, we used to do nine months of isoniazid. However, by adding rifapentin, we only need to do three months. And that's nice because then you're gonna have increased compliance and you're also going to reduce the risk of hepatotoxicity. And that's because isoniazid is hepatotoxic. So if we can only take that for three months instead of nine months, that's nice. Now, in pregnant women and children less than two years, we have to devise a different strategy. You will not be asked about that. If you have a positive chest x-ray and sputum, then you have primary TB. These patients go on to ripe therapy, and we already talked about that. This is just more comprehensive from the CDC. Uh, you can read this if you want. Now, what about the BCG vaccine? The big thing about the BCG vaccine is that people who have gotten it will have a false positive Manto test. So for that reason, these people are going to get an IGRA rather than a Manto test because the IGRA will not give a false positive unlike the Manto test. Okay, so this BCG vaccine uh, used to be given in a lot of countries. Um, however, they've discontinued it in most of Europe and in Australia and New Zealand. It's really never been given too much here in the United States. Not sure about Canada, but uh, it's it, in a lot of countries, it's not given anymore. Uh, the places where BCG tends to be given uh, routinely is in endemic countries. So that just adds to the complication uh, to this. Uh, but you should be aware that older people older Europeans may have gotten the BCG vaccine, and then people from endemic areas may have gotten it as well. So you may wanna to go to IGRA for those people instead of messing around with the Manto test. So to recap, active TB presents with pulmonary symptoms and flu-like symptoms, weight loss, night sweats, stuff like that. Latent TB, however, is asymptomatic. The best next step when suspecting TB is chest X-ray and sputum. Uh, the classic at-risk groups are going to be immigrants, travelers, immunosuppressed people, and those with underlying pulmonary conditions like COPD, asthma, and stuff like that. Uh, the screening is no longer recommended in uh, healthcare workers and in some at-risk groups. I'm just going to say healthcare workers here. Common indications for screening are recent exposure and patients who are about to start anti-TNF drugs. Manto and IGRA are screening tests. Negative tests uh, may be repeated in one to two weeks. Positive tests should always be followed by confirmatory tests. That's chest x-ray and sputum stain. Uh, if you have a positive confirmatory test, then this is a person with primary TB. They need to go on ripe therapy. If they have a negative confirmatory test, then it's a latent TB. And what we do then is isoniazid and rifapentin uh, for, uh, I believe that should be three months there. And then remember, you need to know your major side effects for rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol because they are frequently tested.